Hello, so the Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focused webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. So, hey everyone, I'm Dan, the chair for today. I am the CEO and founder of a company I started called BioRelate. Um, BioRelate is a business very much involved in data curation to support the drug discovery industry. And I have a long background in computational biology, and it really is my pleasure to be chairing today's event. I should also mention that I'm part of the early career advisory panel here at the Biochemistry Society, and I, I very much, um, as I say, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be chairing today's session. So this webinar is part of our dedicated early career research program of webinars, and we're delighted to provide the opportunity today for Robin, Marika, Feiden, and Teresa to share their work with the biosciences community. Today's webinar is titled Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, and we'll hear from these four speakers who will share their current work in this field. Before I hand over to our first speaker, please note that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, so please do send in your questions during the talks. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. So our first speaker today is Dr. Robin Curie from the University of Oxford. Robin is a postdoctoral researcher in the Sanson and Stansfield labs, where he uses molecular dynamics simulations to study biological membranes and membrane proteins. In particular, he focuses on developing methods for determining the affinities of specific protein lipid interactions. And today, Robin will discuss the lab's work in identifying and characterizing the structural basis of these protein lipid interactions using computational methods based around coarse grained and atomistic molecular dynamics simulations. Over to you, Robin. Great, thank you for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers for setting this webinar up. It looks really interesting. I'm very excited to see the other talks. So yes, um, I'm a postdoc in the Stansted and Sansom labs at Oxford and Warwick, and uh, I'll be talking about work that's ongoing in these labs using MD to um, identify and characterize protein lipid interactions. So a very brief overview of my talk. I'll be uh, first of all talking about why we want to do this, uh, how we approach this using coarse-grained MD, what methods we have for identifying binding sites from our simulation data, and also how we use free energy calculations to identify or predict the affinities of these interactions. So why do we want to model protein lipid interactions? And just clarify here, I mean uh, specific lipid interactions. So when a particular lipid such as PIP2 and here in yellow binds to a defined binding site region on the surface of a protein of interest, such as the Kia 2.2 ion channel. And these interactions are typically quite long lived, so microseconds, uh, timescales, and above. Uh, and they can have a number of profound effects on the protein. So they can, you know, they're important in the biogenesis of the protein, so how it inserts and folds in the membrane, uh, how the protein is localized within the cell. Uh, it, they help mediate protein protein interactions, so dimers, oligomers, and complexes. And also they can directly impact the function of the protein. So an example of this is PIP2 uh, binds the Kia channel and stabilizes this open conformation of the channel here. So there are many ways of um, identifying these interactions and we use uh, molecular dynamics for it. So very briefly for MD, I won't talk about it in, in depth, but it's a way of computationally kind of predicting the dynamics and conformations of a, of a given system. And typically you might, in, you know, for a, a system include each atom explicitly, such, such as shown here for the PIP2 lipid. Um, because of the time scales of the, the systems we're interested in, like the interaction we're interested in, and also the, the number of simulations we might want to run, uh, what we use is a coarse grained force field using the Martini force field. And here groups of atoms are represented by a single bead. And this 
increases the sampling speed uh, dramatically, uh, whilst also providing a good level of accuracy for the things we're looking at. So what we can do is we can uh, build our protein of interest into a bilayer comprised of um, you know, a number of different lipids or one lipid or whatever we, we like, um, and then run a simulation to allow the uh, lipids to interact with the protein. Uh, and for a system of this kind of size, we'll use Gromax uh, 2021 for this. And on a standard Linux box, we can get maybe five microseconds a day. We can, of course, uh, also uh, convert these systems to an atomistic description uh, using a, a program such as CG2AT, which has been written by um, someone in the Stansted lab. And as you can see, you know, there's a lot more atoms and there's a lot slower. So um, it is, you know, it's slower sampling, but you do get this higher degree of accuracy uh, for looking at the, the specifics of the interaction. So once we've run our simulations, we want to identify uh, binary sites from the data. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we can do this. And these are outlined in this book chapter, which is about to be published hopefully next month. So the details of how to do this are laid out here. So one method is to um, calculate the density of your lipid of interest around the protein uh, using a tool such as the Volmap tool in uh, VMD. And this is kind of analogous to getting density from a structural uh, data set. And here you can see, you can kind of identify what looks to be a nice binding site for this lipid. Another way is to uh, quantify the interaction likelihood between your lipid of interest and the residues on the surface of the protein. And then you can color the residues by contact frequency. As you can see here, these green residues all have a high contact likelihood to uh, the lipid of interest. So that suggests this is a, a nice little binding site. And more, uh, more recently, we've been kind of trying to extend this analysis using uh, like a network analysis with graph theory to kind of actually look at which residues interacting with specific lipid molecules at the same time. Um, and then they cluster these into sites. As we see here for the same data shown in the middle panel, we actually see two different sites where two lipids are able to bind. And we've written this into a Python package you can download now from GitHub called PyLipID. And this is quite, um, it's quite a fast and, um, and rigorous and automated way of looking at binding sites. It's, it's very user-friendly, I think. And as an example of what we've been doing with it, uh, this is a data set using 42 different E. coli membrane proteins. And using pilot ID and course grain simulation, we've been able to identify um, over 700 binding sites for this lipid, cardiolipin, um, which is in a paper about to come out. So increasingly, we're interested not just in uh, if and where a, a lipid might bind to our protein of interest, but also what the affinity of this interaction is. And, uh, you know, in other words, in a complex membrane environment, how likely is it that our specific lipid will bind to the binding site rather than a different lipid? Um, and one way of doing this is using free energy calculations. And kind of simply put, this involves, you know, simulating two key states of the system. State one, where you've got your lipid bound to your binding site, and then state zero, where the lipid is not on the binding site and free in the membrane. And the difference between these states we can call uh, delta G of bind. So this is the free energy of, of, of binding. And I'll kind of do a bit of a whistle stop tour on the, the main ways we do this, but all the details of how we set these up, you know, the settings and the plume code and stuff, you can be found in this paper here. So the first technique is a potential mean force calculation, so PMF. And kind of simply put, this involves using steered MD to um, slowly remove the lipid from the binding site and into the bulk membrane. We can then use um, umbrella sampling um, along this reaction coordinate uh, to generate this one dimensional energy landscape. And for us, the, the, the free energy of binding is, is the difference between this energy well and bulk. So in the case of Kia 2.2 and PIP2, it's about 46 kilojoules per, per mole. Uh, another technique we use is a uh, free energy perturbation, FEP. And kind of simply put, um, this involves taking your molecule of interest, so PIP2 lipid, and uh, converting it using an alchemical transformation to a generic lipid, uh, POPC in this case. 
If you do this uh, for the lipid when it's free in the membrane and when bound to the protein, you can then compare these values uh, using this thermodynamic cycle to get a delta delta G between uh, your lipid of interest and generic lipid. And um, what we get is actually we get a quite a similar value to the delta G of binding as obtained with the PMF for, for a lot less computational resource, I should add. I should add. And then finally, um, uh, well-tempered metadynamics. And to simplify a lot, basically this involves um, applying Gaussians of energy uh, to the lipid so that it never stays in the same place too long and kind of keeps moving around. And the more Gaussians of energy you have to apply, uh, the, the higher the, the, the affinity for that particular site. You can then, um, it's just the details, you can then use the amount of Gaussians applied to kind of reconstruct this 2D landscape for your lipid around the protein. So this is a lot more costly in terms of computational time than the previous techniques, but you do get a much more complete view of the protein lipid landscape, and you don't need to know the actual site before you run the free energy calculation. So we ran these for a number of different protein lipid systems and we get fairly good agreement between the different methods for uh, our, our free energies of binding. And crucially, we get a similar ranking for different sites, which is great. And this suggests you can kind of choose the free energy method you want based on the system you have or the question you want to ask. So to conclude, uh, we can use coarse grain dynamics to sample protein lipid systems on a microsecond time scale. We can, if we want, convert um, these systems to atomistic for high resolution uh, simulations using programs such as CG2AT. There are multiple ways of identifying binding sites from our simulation data, including the PyLIP ID Python package. And then we can also use free energy methods to uh, calculate uh, the affinities of these interactions. Okay, so thanks to everyone in the labs, particularly Owen Vickery, who did a lot of work with free energy calculations and also wrote the CG280 program, and Wen Ling Song, who wrote the PyLIP ID program. And uh, thanks to our funders and the organizers, and thanks to you for listening. Thank you, an amazing talk, Robin. Uh, our next speaker today is Dr. Marika Posner from Manchester Metropolitan University. And Marika is a senior lecturer who studies the structure function relationship of proteins using biophysical techniques. When lab work was suspended during the COVID-19 lockdown, her group started exploring bioinformatics slash data analyses to study the function of multimerin one instead. So today, Marika will discuss her journey from identifying the interaction between multimerin one and EFB to using bioinformatics to study and understand a possible role of multimerin one in cancer and what this information may mean for future research on multimerin one. Um, so I proudly introduce you to Marika. Thank you very much for the introduction and giving me the opportunity to today share with you some of the work we have been doing on multimerin one in cancer. So in my talk, I will introduce you to uh, the protein multimerin one and why we are studying it, uh, how we did the bioinformatics to explain its role in cancer, and I will conclude with future directions. So how we originally got interested in multimerin one actually came through our research in uh, Staphylococcus aureus pathogenicity. So uh, as aureus is a formidable pathogen and it uses um, an arsenal of proteins that helps it to aid its infection evading the immune system response and extracellular fibrinogen binding protein or EFB is one of those proteins and it was known that EFB inhibits platelet activation so it is antithrombotic but the mechanism wasn't understood so we wanted to know how does EFB as a protein exert this function and we looked at its interaction with plated proteins and the result is summarized here so we did an affinity pull down uh, with EFB recombinant EFB construct and a shorter version which only um, corresponds to an N-terminal part of EFBN and uh, we incubated this with plated lysate and the condition was that we either included fibrinogen or we omitted fibrinogen and the reason for this is, as the name of EFB suggests, it interacts with fibrinogen and we wanted to see does fibrinogen binding change its interaction with plated proteins. And when we looked then for which plated proteins EFB um, was pulling down, we found quite a few plated proteins. 
Uh, but what we found very interesting is that it pulled down multimarin 1, and that interaction was direct, so it was fibrinogen independent. And this interaction had not been previously been reported. So we thought, does multimarin 1 potentially have a role in the host pathogen interaction? And the next question is, why would EFB target multimarin? And when we looked at the function of multimarin 1, multimarin 1 in the platelets is involved in hemostasis, so thrombus formation, cell adhesion. So it seemed to be quite a nice link with EFB's antithrombotic activity targeting multimarin 1. And multimarin 1 is also expressed in megakaryocytes, endothelial cells, and it's also deposited in the ECM. And we looked at the uh, protein structure of multimarin 1. It is a large protein. It has uh, some assigned domains, the EMI domain, cold cold regions, an EGF domain, and a globular C1Q domain. But despite what is known about multimarin 1 uh, in platelets, none of these domains has been actually assigned a role in this mechanism. The only thing that is known is that the RGD motif is required for cell adhesion via integrin. So we were all set up to study the interaction of uh, EFB constructs with multimarin 1 constructs to explain this interaction between the two proteins. But then uh, COVID happened and there was a time where we could not do any lab work. And we were thinking, is there something we can do to maybe characterize multimarin 1 function a bit more without this lab work? And we had stumbled upon reports of multimarin 1 in cancer. So it has been reported that multimarin 1 expression levels are quite uh, changed in cancer. It has even been uh, postulated to be a biomarker for certain cancers. So we thought, can we use bioinformatics and database analysis to maybe explain this role? And as you have gathered from the introduction and my previous slides, uh, we are not usually geared onto bioinformatics or cancer. So we used this opportunity to familiarize ourselves with what was out there in terms of cancer um, data analysis. And there are a lot of programs and databases available. These are just a few shown here. It's beyond the scope of this talk to go into detail into these programs, but I would like to um, highlight some of the key um, results we got using these uh, databases. So using Oncomine, we were able to identify that Multiman 1 is, uh, expression is down in nine cancer types. And this is quite uh, interesting that it's um, consistently down. And we thought, does this down regulation of multimarin 1 correlate perhaps to the overall survival of, pen of cancer patients? And we used Kaplan-Meier analysis. And in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is, seems to be an advantage of having um, higher multimarin 1 expression levels. It's, um, it helps the prognosis of cancer patients. However, this trend we see in breast cancer is, is not consistent across all the cancers. So it depends on the cancer and the, um, and the data set whether multimarin 1 levels uh, have a significant difference on over survival or not. We also looked at the um, effect of that mutations may have on multimarin 1 and its role in cancer. But as it turns out, it's, um, it's unlikely to be a mutation that causes multimarin 1 um, downregulation, and there is no uh, like set of distinct mutations that is consistent across the different cancers in which multimarin 1 is downregulated. However, given that the expression of multimarin 1 is so uh, significant across these cancers, we thought it might be because multimarin 1 is part of a pathway with, which may have not been considered in its function. So we turned into network analysis, and when we are using information like in the string database, we uh, retrieved information about well-characterized proteins interactions of multimarin 1 that are all uh, going to its role in platelet and hemostasis. And I have highlighted these here in blue. However, there were reports where people had done experimental evidence of multimarin 1, where there is a direct protein-protein interaction reported. And those proteins that are interacting with multimarin 1 I have here highlighted in pink. And we can already see if we are trying to make a network, there seems to be a gap because this connection that was shown here in these experiments cannot be explained with the network. However, if we are now looking into the network, zooming in a little bit, so what was shown here in blue is now in a, uh, has the edge blue and 
pink has the edge pink. So those are the proteins that are from experimental evidence and uh, also here. And what we can see now in pale yellow is that to reconstitute this network to explain uh, how these um, proteins and uh, genes work together, we have been now given um, a variety of um, possible candidates that are involved and interact with multimeron as the closest direct neighbor, but this has not been reported yet. So this is a very good way of this network analysis to get us started into looking further into um, uh, enrichment, which genes are highlighted and which are um, uh, sharing a common pathway. So it is a good starting point we can pursue in the future to explain the differential regulation of uh, multimeron 1. And what this basically shows that despite the um, what is known about multimeron 1 and platelets, there are certainly some platelet independent mechanisms of multimeron 1 that have not um, received the attention yet that it probably should have. And in our um, analysis of differential expression, we also found that the uh, multimeron 1 levels are differentially expressed in inflammatory diseases and infections. And this includes even uh, some studies uh, relating to COVID-19, where they can see a change in multimeron 1 expression levels. So based on this, we are more than uh, ever convinced that it's time to study multimeron 1 protein interactions, identify the role of those domains. We will start with our EFB proteins, but we will certainly also look at some of the other interactions that has come out of this uh, project with multimeron 1 in cancer. And on this note, I would like to thank uh, my student, Chiara, who was involved in the analysis, my collaborators, Stefan Beckby from University of Bath and Giordano Paula, and uh, I'm sure there will be questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariko. A fascinating talk. And so our third speaker is Dr. Faden Rotsakis from the University of Cambridge. Hayden is an FEBS postdoc fellow at the Centre of Misfolding Diseases at the Department of Chemistry of the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on combining molecular simulations with cryo-electron microscopy data to unveil key protein structure and motion. Such a microscopic perspective can lead to novel pharmaceutical strategies that are further tested in the lab. During his talk, Faden will illustrate examples where integrating molecular simulations and cryo-EM data lead to fully resolved structural ensembles that can be used to predict stability, altering post-translational modifications in a tau microtubule complex and potentially inactive state stabilizing cryptic small molecules in a spike SARS-CoV-2 protein. Without further ado, over to you, Faden. Hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for the um, for the announcement. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about basically the first part of of this announcing summary, and that is how we can uh, use computational structure biology techniques uh, combined with uh, experimental data in order to determine uh, structures or structural ensembles that can capture the uh, dynamics of uh, disease causing. Um, proteins and uh, in particular I would like to basically uh, devote a few seconds on the well a very prominent um, structural biologic technique and that is the cryo-electron microscopy technique which is basically becoming this golden standard in determining uh, proteins or biological structures. Um, this technique is able to um, basically address uh, a broad uh, molecular uh, weight uh, range, or if you want a broad length scale of, uh, of biomolecules. Uh, and, and, and one of the big advantages is that, is it, that it can um, do so by having the sample in near uh, physiological environmental co conditions. Now, the big uh, bottleneck uh, in this uh, structure de determination uh, technique is that it really faces uh, difficulties once it comes to uh, biomolecules that are that depict that that um, that include or entail a very heterogeneous uh, ensemble that basically reflects the, the the very dynamics or a dynamic mechanism at play, and I would like to basically uh, show what I mean by this. So, for instance, consider on the left hand side here 
uh, a, a protein folding um, mechanism uh, in, in a free energy representation. So basically here, uh, y-axis is the free energy. So unfolded structures have a higher energy than folded structures, we have a which have a lower free energy. And of course, uh, and this is a reaction coordinate, um, which, which can be, which basically determines uh, or describes actually the process that the mechanism at play. But the main point here is that, uh, for instance, this protein uh, folding mechanism uh, basically uh, comprises of uh, an ensemble of structures that, that rather than a single structure alone. So, uh, and, and in, a, in a different type of uh, example, uh, on the right-hand side here, um, basically, uh, we, 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 what we mean when we say a structural ensemble is uh, basically it comprises of two, uh, three components. So the first is that we we have uh, states or structural uh, or structures. So here we have three structures. Then the other component of a structural ensemble is that these states do have a, a population that is dictated by the thermodynamics, and also uh, these structures interconvert with a particular time scale or rate constant that is determined by uh, by the very uh, dynamics. So all three components, they constitute the structural ensemble. And these very three components are uh, the, the very reason that, uh, that often uh, structural experiments, also electron microscopy ones, they, are, they do find a blur signal, so a very low uh, signal to uh, noise uh, ratio. And this is the very consequence of, of this structural ensemble. So basically of these three components shown here. So such dynamics is aberrant uh, when one is talking about biological function. So and here I'm going to uh, talk about basically our approach uh, to basically combine molecular simulations and uh, prior electron microscopy data in order to, uh, to, in the end of the day, output a structural ensemble that is able to capture such uh, dynamic mechanisms. So first we start by, I mean, uh, this is a, a very uh, raw cartoon of what's going on in a, in a cryo-electron microscopy experiment. So one starts with uh, basically taking uh, a video or of, of following sim single particles um, on a grid in um, cryogenic uh, conditions. And then um, basically the protocol follows a 2D classification of the, of the single particles. And using these 2D classes, one is able to uh, reconstruct a 3D uh, electron microscopy map. Now, this electron microscopy map, uh, as shown here, and this is for a, a protein X, this is a spike protein. So, this EM map uh, is uh, has a comprise. I mean, com it, it comprises regions of a high electron density or different. So, for instance, here in blue. Uh, other, in other words, of a very uh, high resolution, but also there are regions with low resolution, for instance, the red ones here that have low electron densities. So for these red regions, there is actually no way to assign a single structure uh, that can actually fit this low electron density map. And this low electron density component uh, here is the very uh, out outcome of, of the dynamics or the dynamic mechanism I was talking about earlier. So for instance, for this very protein, uh, the structure, and this is a general phenomenon, so the structure that came out of this electron density map uh, misses, in fact, these very red regions that are shown here. And these very red regions, uh, they, they relate to these very uh, low resolution regions on the EM map. But these very red, uh, so these missing regions in the experimental structure um, are very much related to the function of this protein. And I'm going to talk about this very protein uh, later. So a way to basically circumvent this uh, is to combine basically the electron microscopy data or other experimental data, but today I'm focusing on EM data. So combine this EM data with molecular dynamics. And this was mentioned earlier in the first talk. Now, molecular dynamics is a, uh, is, a, is a technique that is able to provide us with uh, structures of, for instance, in this case, proteins uh, and with, with a particular uh, kinetics and dynamics 
based on uh, first principle uh, determined potential energy surface models. But of course, the fourth, which we call the fourth fields, but the fourth fields are rather problematic uh, often uh, due to their general uh, role, so they're not extremely accurate. So by basically combining electron microscopy data, in this case, with molecular dynamics, and basically by correcting on the fly the uh, molecular dynamics configurational ensemble, correcting it by introducing the electron microscopy data, we're able to generate a new ensemble, which we'll be calling the full structural ensemble. And this is a method called EMI that was developed in, in our lab uh, a few years back. So to go to cut to the chase, um, we applied this method in, in uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, recognition step um, which basically uh, is the step where, so this is the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virion, and we have the spike protein here. So spike, the first step, recognizes the host cell uh, uh, membrane receptor protein, or uh, ACE2, um, and then it follows, uh, it fuses in the membrane. But this is the second step. We were very interested in this very first step. So how does the recognition happen? And it, uh, so spike uh, follows a, is the so-called conformational masking strategy. So the spike protein uh, exists in an open state formation where, where it is active, so it is able to recognize the ACE2 receptor. And in a, in a closed state uh, configuration here, where uh, the RBD uh, faces up, so faces down, excuse me. Um, so this is a no uh, recognition uh, state and the, the the reason for this is that it spike wants to avoid basically natural antibodies uh and and, and in the immune response system so however in, in the closed state so in, a, in this state uh well small molecules or antibodies they really or they really find a hard time targeting spike uh however in the open state uh spike exhibits a shield of glycans and makes it very difficult for it to uh, targeted with small molecules or with antibodies. So we would like to uh, be able to target spike with small molecules uh, in intermediate states along the opening pathway from the open to the closed state where it can be most vulnerable. So to do that, we basically supplied uh, our molecular dynamics in the EMI framework with the uh, open state electron microscopy map and uh, we were able to uh, determine the full structural ensemble of the opening transition. So first of all, uh, one, one, out, one result is that uh, this is a full spike, so there are no more missing regions in the RBD domain, which is where the, the region where spike recognizes the ACE2 receptor. Another observation is indeed that there is a very heterogeneous glycan shield. It's almost like a, a sort of a brush um, that that helps spike avoid uh, natural antibodies. And of course, that the RBD experiences a variety of information. So this is the, what I was talking about earlier. This, this is this uh, heterogeneous structural ensemble. When we plot this uh, heterogeneous structural ensemble in terms of a free energy surface or a, a reverse, if you want, uh, population or probability distribution uh, as a function of the distance from the closed state or the distance from the open state, or in other words, uh, here, this is the open state, this is the fully closed state. We do see that there are two transition pathways that go from the open towards the closed state by uh, basically passing through intermediate states. Uh, and, and we were able to identify that in state C2 and C3, there is a cryptic binding site, this one, which basically sits between glycans, uh, uh, glycosylated asparagine 165 and 245, and in this position, uh, we believe that this is a, a vulnerability point, a cryptic site along the opening transition where we can actually uh, in, uh, target it with using uh, small molecules in a screening study. Now, uh, we have some faith on these uh, residues. They have been reported to be very important for the stability of, uh, sorry, for the hinge motion and thereby, um, which is increases our confidence. So to conclude, I'd like to say that our structural ensemble provides a, a mechanistic understanding in atomistic level of the opening transition of spike. And the future work we're going to target that uh, cryptic site with uh, in a virtual screening protocol uh, with small molecules and then assess whether these small molecules inhibit ACE2 binding. And final important point is that 
by having such a structural ensemble, we, we are able to identify possible anti epitopes for antibody design. I would like to thank uh, uh, Michele Vendruscolo and the, and the team, uh, the supervisor and the team in the University of Cambridge, FEBS for the support, CMD, and of course you for your, for your attention. And uh, I'd like to say that all the data are available in the Plume Nest repository. Thank you. Thanks, Faden. Another fascinating talk there. Um, just a quick reminder to anyone that wants to ask questions, if you could stick the name of the speaker on the question, that's going to help me when I get to ask the speakers at the end of this. Thanks a lot. Um, so our last invited speaker today is Teresa Goguri at the Francis Crick Institute London. So Teresa is a final year PhD at the Francis Crick Institute in London, soon moving to New York to start a postdoc position at Friedman Brain Institute at Mount Sinai. Her uh, research interests are focused around biophysics and bioinformatics of 3D genome folding function and regulation, both in cell division and cell differentiation. So today, Teresa will present her work comparing two prominent models for the structural maintenance of chromosome complexes on the chromatin chain, loop intrusion and diffusion capture, stochastic pairwise interaction. Um, so over to you, Teresa. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for a lovely introduction and also thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my work as I'm still a PhD student. Um, and I'm uh, co-shared between Paul Bates lab, which is purely computational uh, lab, and Frank Ullman's lab, which is uh, purely experimental lab. So my work is uh, like a bridge between these two worlds. And before I jump into my um, presentation, I would just like to acknowledge uh, Yasuka Kui, a past postdoc in Frank Ullman's lab, who did all the supporting wet lab experiments for our study. Uh, so as the title of my talk says, I will be talking about uh, the biophysical properties and computation, as well as uh, uh, the overall biophysical properties of mitotic chromosome formation. Um, so it's been well established that protein named condensin is responsible for chromosome compaction in mitosis. And indeed, it's uh, a very uh, crucial key player throughout the whole cell cycle. And condensin protein is a part of SMC family of proteins consisting of SMC24 heterodimer, which is a cord cord ring, um, finishing off with ATPase heads, uh, plus uh, certain subunits such as glycin below that regulates its dynamic. Many years ago, there's been a very famous uh, and groundbreaking experiment done in Xenopusek extracts, um, where the, uh, the Hiran lab looked at the extracted Xenopusek without uh, any condensin present. And what they observed was that uh, the chromatin was fairly diffuse and was not able to compact at all. Uh, however, when they added a uh, human condensin, purified human condensing, um, the chromosome uh, was able to compact um, to resemble uh, the fairly uh, mitotic chromosome. So what was really groundbreaking in this experiment was that even from different species, condensing was able to recapitulate uh, the chromosome compaction. So it's been uh, well established uh, what actually condensin is doing uh, on chromatin, but what is less known is the exact molecular mechanism by which condensin performs the chromosome compaction. Um, and this still remains an open debate. Uh, so there's been quite a few proposed models for um, mechanism of condensing activity. And I will be talking about uh, those most prominent ones. So loop extrusion model is the one that's probably most well spread and most well known. And it's based on the fact that condensing or loop extruding factor loop extruding protein is able to dynamically exchange with environment. And once it's loaded on chromatin chain, that's shown here, it can start to actively translocate along the chromatin chain, but not only translocate, not only walk in both directions, but it's also able to pull the chromatin chain inside of its ring, thus forming a tiny loop that can then be in time extended, nested or dissolved when uh, the condensing is being reloaded. This model has been recently um, kind of supported by single molecule in vitro studies on lambda naked DNA. And what they observed here was the formation of chromatin loop, but more, I would say, DNA loop rather than a chromatin loop. And what still remains to be explored is whether loop extrusion could actually happen in vivo. Um, an opposing model is so-called diffusion capture model, which is not based on active translocation uh, along chromatin chain, but it's more based on a stochastic pairwise interaction, protein-protein interaction between um, distinct condensing. 
So based on this model, chromatin compaction could happen when two distinct condensins could, uh, could come um, into spatial proximity, then they could form an interaction and thus forming so-called condensin clusters. And by forming these condensin clusters, they can compact chromatin and also they can passively form chromatin loops. So the question that we asked in our project was that we kind of wanted to explore which of these models is more likely to recapitulate uh, the experimental observations and characterizations of uh, mitotic chromosome formation in fission yeast. So what we did was that we decided to develop a completely the novel biophysical simulation tool software that would allow us to uh, simulate uh, both uh, loop extrusion and um, diffusion capture model. So we modeled the chromatin chain as a homopolymer consisting of consecutive beads. Uh, those are uh, the gray ones. Each bead corresponds roughly to nanonucleosomes that covers uh, 2kb genomic distance. And we apply tension force, repulsion forces in between the adjacent beads so that we actually allow the behavior of homopolymer to happen. On the top of that, we of course introduced stochastic force that would allow uh, to introduce or to mimic the Brownian motion. And the contents in protein was modeled very simply as a pair of blue beads that could interact with uh, the chromatin chain on specific positions. Those specific positions are colored in pink or um, purple and are called condensin binding sites. These condensin binding sites are derived straight from the ChIP-seq condensin experiment in mitosis of fission yeast. So that everything we do in our simulations is really benchmarked against all the experimental data that are available in our lab or um, based on uh, previous published data. So this was to describe actually the chromatin chain as such, but not uh, the models that could then uh, develop uh, the uh, chromatin condensation. So the way we um, modeled or implemented diffusion capture um, is in such a way that uh, the condensing molecules, the blue beads, were allowed to interact with their condensing binding sites, the purple ones, and they remained there bound stably throughout the whole simulation. Then in each simulation time step, what we do is that we check the Euclidean distance between any pair of distinct condensing molecules. And if this distance is within a certain cutoff distance that we then again benchmark based on um, experimental data, we then calculate a condensing uh, diffusion capture pair probab probability. And this probability um, basically dictates whether uh, the interaction between two condensins could happen or not. Um, loop extrusion model, on the other hand, is implemented differently. So as I mentioned when describing the loop extrusion in general, um, the prerequisite is that condensing is able to uh, dynamically exchange with the environment. So this is what we also implemented by uh, using unloading uh, loading probability. So once condensing is loaded to an empty condensing binding site, it can start to translocate in both direction on the chromatin chain and pulling the chromatin chain behind uh, in the form of a loop. So these are two distinct modes of chromatin condensation that we implemented. And because we wanted to compare how could potentially interface and mitosis look like in our simulations, we then went back and uh, we checked the experimental data. What we found out is that in interface in fission is there is only very little condensing present in the nucleus, while in mitosis there is high abundance of condensing present in the nucleus. So what we did simply for our in silico interface is that we depleted 85% of condensing, while in mitosis we allowed all the chip six sites to be occupied by condensing. So this was to describe the simulation model that we developed. But now really the fun part starts where we were trying to benchmark or to basically analyze our simulations and then compare with experimental data that we had in our lab or perform new experiments to benchmark. And to really um, explore the variety of bi biophysical properties that could characterize um, mitotic chromosome formation or actually the chromatin in as such uh, throughout the whole cell cycle, we divided our readouts into three groups. So the blue ones corresponds to geometrical-like aspects of chromatin, consisting of axial compaction measurements, contact probability, chromosome contact probabilities, and chromatin volume measurements. 
then we focused on measuring and exploring the dynamics of chromatin, which is something that very, very little people are interested in. And then last but not least, we focused on the 3D uh, colloquialization and clustering of condensing within uh, the chromatin. So what we found out uh, from the experimental data is that condensing promotes axial compaction and actually shrinking uh, the chromosomes throughout mitosis. And it's really in a condensing dependent manner. And when running our simulations with different parameters, what we found out is that only in silico mitosis condition of diffusion capture was able to faithfully recapitulate uh, the in vivo data, but not loop extrusion. Then moving to chromatin connectivity, we performed high C experiments to inspect the chromatin interaction landscape. And um, as a signature of uh, mitosis across any species is um, the enhancement or enrichment of long range interactions, which can be seen as this bump in this trend line. And uh, the range of genomic um, interactions where this uh, enrichment happens is uh, species specific which is also very important. And in order to explore the same thing in our simulations, uh, we analyzed so-called in silico high C type of experiments. And what we found out is that <clears throat> qualitatively, not quantitatively, but qualitatively, both models are able to perform, um, let's say, some or a amount of uh, enrichment of longer range interactions. But where these interactions happen is very different when looking at diffusion capture and loop extrusion. And again, only diffusion capture is able to fit uh, the genomic um, interactions uh, to the same range as in vivo. And then last of the geometric-like aspects is DNA volume. So intuitively you would feel that of course the compacted chroma chromatin has a different uh, volume and the volume is reduced. So we quantified it uh, via fluorescence microscopy and again, we confirmed that this is a condensing dependent feature of a uh, mitotic chromosome. And again, without any surprise, what we found out that only diffusion capture clustering mechanism is able to uh, reproduce this data, but not loop extrusion. Then we moved on to uh, quite a novel niche of uh, the field, which is focusing on the dynamics of uh, chromatin. We measured mean square displacement uh, of interface and mitotic chromatin. And what we found out is that mitotic chromatin's motion is uh, highly restrained. And not only that, uh, we pushed this study a little bit further and we asked the question, okay, so if the mitotic chromatin's mobility is constrained, does it also introduce uh, a amount of anisotropy of the motion? And indeed, I'm not, I'm not showing the data, but we also observed an emergence of anisotropy in mitosis. So we decided to analyze exactly the same for our simulations. And very surprisingly, we found out that diffusion capture is able to reproduce a reduction of MSD um, coefficient as well as emergence of anisotropy, while loop extrusion is failing in both of these. And the last thing that we analyzed was to look at the 3D colocalization of condensing within the mitotic uh, chromatin and its clustering. Uh, so we performed storm experiments on fission east uh, mitotic nuclei, and each dot corresponds to a breaching event of a single condensing molecule. And just to give you an idea of uh, snapshots of uh, clustering, uh, what we found out in, from the in vivo experiments that are then actually quite consistent with uh, the in vivo experiments of higher species is that we have a very broad range of cluster sizes of condensing. So we do have many clusters that are tiny, but also many clusters that are very large, and also those that are uh, intermediate. While when we perform clustering analysis on our simulations of diffusion capture and loop extrusion, what we found out that these two models actually lie on the opposite ends of spectrum. So diffusion capture uh, giving us quite large clusters, while loop extrusion giving us very tiny clusters. So this is bringing kind of a question whether the reality is not necessarily like mixing both of these models together, or whether we need to introduce more spatial constraints on all of these models to modify them so that we can actually uh, get the uh, in vivo data. 
So uh, just to wrap up uh, this project and then end the talk. So what we found out is that uh, exploring loop extrusion and diffusion capture model uh, and various aspects of biophysical properties of mitotic chromosome, we found out that a very interesting name, diffusion capture appears to be a, a very uh, elegant model to explore, uh, to explain a chromatin compaction in fission yeast, not loop extrusion. And mm, on the top of that, well, what we were able to establish are the modes of um, condensing and its impact on chromatin that can be observed throughout the whole cell cycle. So what we found out is that uh, condensing is affecting axial compaction, chromatin connectivity, chromatin volume, and chromatin mobility. But what is more interesting is that it's affecting those both in interface as well as in mitosis. The only difference is the concentration. So when the concentration is little, of course, we only observe uh, a very small impact on the chromatin, but with increasing concentration throughout the whole cell cycle, we observe more of this impact that then leads to formation of mitotic chromosome. And with this, I would like to uh, finish my talk and acknowledge people that are really very crucial for this project. Um, Paul Bates and Frank Ullman, both of my supervisors who were really very helpful and supportive. Uh, Jean, who's uh, a past postdoc in, um, uh, who's current postdoc, I'm sorry, current postdoc in our lab, and was very helpful with all the physics and support uh, throughout the coding. And then Yasu, uh, who did all the wet lab experiments. Thanks, Teresa. Another wonderful talk there. Um, so we're now on to our questions segment of the event today. So I'm going to invite all of our speakers to um, come back and join for this, this part of the talk. If you've still got a question in the audience, please do type it in the question box as shown uh, in the image on the screen and stick the name of the speaker on the question as well. That's really going to help me. Um, so I've got a, a few questions here I can ask already that people have been asking if we've gone through the talks. Um, let's go to the first one, which was asked by Kenzia Fernandez, um, which I believe is is for Robin here. How did you develop pine lipid? Okay, so it was it was is based on um, some theory coming out of graph theory from a while ago, and there was a, a paper um, doing something similar with uh, cholesterol, like doing it kind of um, uh, for for kind of looking at my analysis, so what we did basically is we just uh, built it up as a Python library using loads and different data sets and trying to refine the best way of inputting it. So most of the work was done by Wan Ling Song, who did a lot of the coding, but we're just trying to find a way to um, iterate through and uh, make it as broadly applicable as possible, which is quite a difficult task. Okay, thanks. Robin. Um, so next question was asked by Robbie Baldock. Um, it's from Marika. How was the network analysis performed? Is there any specific software packages that we used? Uh, thanks. All right. Um, yeah, in terms of some of the analyses, um, some of these databases are complementary. And uh, I wouldn't uh, suggest one analysis is better than the other. It's if you want to use uh, the data set analysis in UCS CSZ now or the expression atlas that is all down to preference and what data sets you want. Um, when it is coming down to the network analysis, there I went for Cytoscape using the plugins and also comparing the data with Gene Mania and um, string analysis. But uh, we did complement whenever we did these interaction analyses with what we also found in the literature just to cross references what we had. And in our network analysis, as I said, the string analysis actually only retrieved uh, the known interaction partners for multimarine one in platelets. It was only later when we added the other experimental data that we could build up the network. But yeah, for that cytoscape, I would highly recommend. Amazing, thanks very much. Um, so finding a question for, for you here, um, which is from Jack Stubbs. Um, have you thought about using time resolved cryo EM data to elucidate further dynamics information and structural ensembles? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I mean, time resolved uh, EM data is, is a very recent, um, is a very recent technique. We haven't done that uh, still. Um, we're looking into this direction and in principle the method uh, is able to accommodate this. However, I would have to, to, to also point out that we would also probably need 
um, that this time resolved EM data uh, should have points in time that are closer and not uh, separated by a, a time scale of, for instance, milliseconds, because this is, for instance, how now solution um, EM or 4D uh, EM is, is performed. Having said that, uh, the, uh, we're, we're working on a method uh, that basically enhances the sampling uh, of ME, so of the molecular dynamics coupled with the EM data, and thereby we could potentially um, reach these timescales. But I think that there should be, uh, you know, uh, developments in both sides. But the method does allow that, and it's a very interesting uh, approach. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so, got a question here for Teresa, and this is from um, Jao Kin Chu. And they're quite, it's a barrage of questions actually. So I'm going to ask uh, maybe one of these. So what is the coarse grained level of your model? Um, does the condensing have the same size as the chromosome bead in your model? And then perhaps one more, have you compared your simulation results to the high C map? Oh, yeah, the, thank you. These are all excellent questions and I didn't have time to properly explain that probably, so I will go through them. So the first one, uh, the coarse graining, uh, I mentioned like every single bead corresponds to 10 nucleosomes, which spans across 2 KB region of genome. And the reason for having this exact uh, coarse graining is that the experimental data that we have for the high C actually have 2 KB resolution. So we really wanted to be consistent. So we kept 2 KB to compare it with the high C. And when I was um, uh, talking about the um, chromatin interaction landscape, this was actually derived from the high C experiment. So the line, the, the CDK is just a different representation or uh, a form of how to analyze high C to get uh, um, the interaction landscape. So so we, we are actually comparing everything with high C. That's, that's the first thing people do. Um, so we did have agreement with uh, diffusion capture and some agreement with loop extrusion. And th this was the reason why we actually um, decided to explore and uh, analyze all other uh, readouts because that's not what other people do. They only, or most of the time, they're looking at high C, sometimes at fish, but that's where they end. So that's why we wanted to push it a little bit further and understand it. Thank you. Um, so Robin, I've got a question for you here and it's from Alexandra Holmes. Um, she says, I like the idea of well-tempered metadynamics. How do you find combining the computational data with experimental data, considering so many structural techniques involve dilapidation of the protein? Yes, yeah, so that's the real big problem, obviously. So we, we can do all these analyses and get really fancy and kind of all the technical and zoomed in. But obviously, unless you've got experimental validation, it's very difficult. And yeah, as you say, m most of the, often you add loads of detergent, you remove your lipids and you put them in a native environment with uh, a non-native environment. So, I mean, it's something we always end our papers with is a call for more experimental data where we can. I mean, you, there are ways of, you know, you can design experiments to test theories to kind of make sure that if you knock out this residue, you see difference in how much lipid binds as opposed, you know, according to a function assay, but it's always a big challenge for sure. Thank you very much. Um, Raika, next question's for you. It's from Shristi Raghavendra. And the question is, how does the MMRN1 play a role in the changes in the rates of breast cancer? Can you repeat this, sorry? Yeah, no, no problem. So it says, how does the MMRN1 play a role in the changes in the rate of breast cancer? All right, that's something, the rate of breast cancer progression, that is something we have not been able to study or look at. Um, however, um, we think at the moment the changes in the uh, multimeron 1 expression levels are a reflection of the changes in the cellular environment. Uh, multimeron 1 being part uh, or deposited in the extracellular matrix interacting with these uh, um, and with the vascular endothelium as the expression that is where when this when the normal cells go to cancer cells where the changes take place and the changes in multimeron one um, is, is um, levels are a reflection of the changes in the cell environment and ecm environment changes oh thank you very much and so next question i've got is for faden and their question is from julia monharas and the question is, what induces the change of the spike from open to closed state? I would say um, evolutionary pressure. 
Um, so in a sense, as, as, as I tried to uh, point out, uh, if Spike only had an uh, open state structure, then it, it would be very much uh, available for, for anti-natural antibodies of our body um, to be attacked. So it doesn't really want uh, to do that. And, and for this reason, it has um, probably evolved uh, its, its genome. Um, and, and of course, it has been a, its, its protein sequence so that basically this conformational switching does occur uh, in the closed state, for instance, uh, I mean, antibodies can't really uh, attack spike. Same holds with glycans. Uh, so this is the so-called conformational masking strategy that is that many uh, well, receptor, uh, sorry, uh, membrane proteins in viruses um, exhibit. So this is a standard uh, conformational switching strategy. Thank you very much. Um, so Teresa, I'll ask you another question from um, Chao Kun Chiu where um, they would like to know, can your model be applied to study cohesing binding in interphase? Oh, yes, uh, so probably I didn't make it really clear. So um, we did indeed simulate the interface. That's not a problem. Uh, and at, at the end of the talk, I was just trying to um, mention that basically the way we are regulating like the cell cycle type of simulations is by uh, alternating the concentration of condensin, which is also based on the available experimental data that the concentration of condensin within the nucleus changes throughout the cell cycle. So this way is how we can mimic different um, points throughout the cell cycle just by changing the concentration or occupancy of uh, the condensin binding sites within. Thank you very much. Um, Robin, next one's for you. Uh, so the error bars in the binding free air energies obtained with SMD plus US and WT wild type meta D simulations were pretty similar. Um, was also the total computational time similar or, or one of the two methods was significantly more expensive uh, than the other? Sure. So, I mean, I should clarify that So, the, the, the error bars represent slightly different things in all, all of the cases. It is what we chose to be the most, you know, meaningful from the data. Um, in terms of the computational cost, the metadynamics data was very expensive. Um, this data I showed, I think, took 200 microseconds or so to actually generate. Um, the PMS with umbrella sampling you know they can be a lot cheaper but again you do need to simulate quite long times to get convergence because your your lipids being pulled away from your protein and the whole membrane has to rearrange around it um so i'd say it was kind of in, in, intermediate the fep is the cheapest by a long way um yeah cool thanks um faden got a question for you um the glycan cloud that you showed on the spike was pretty sparse um, this is from Max Bonomi, by the way. Um, did you only model the sugars visible in the cryo EM structure, or do you, or do you use a more complete, such accurate model like the one published by Romy Amaro slash Eliza Fada et al? I'm assuming you know what that is. Yeah, um, no, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, the uh, in these papers they talk about a distribution of sugars. Um, that exists in in, uh, in in spike. So we we took a more conservative stance and we only uh, keep the uh, M3 part of the sugar. So that is a common part in the in the glycan that uh, is preserved among the different glycans. Now, um, and what was the first part of your question um, of the question, Daniel? I think I missed it. It was about the cloud in the EM map. Yeah. So the the first the first part was about. Uh, essentially, the glycan cloud that you showed on the spike model was pretty sparse. Um, okay. So, yeah. yeah so and the, really, the, sorry. Yeah, this is really related to to the fact that basically uh, we we took the first stretch, uh, which is commonly shared among all glycans. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, so, do you send any more questions if you've got any? We're we're um, obviously running out of time here now, but um, maybe I'll ask another question, one I've not covered. Uh, I'll just try and find one here. Okay, so this is for Fiden again. You're, you're popular today, by the way. In terms of a virtual screen, would you utilize docking approaches? And this yeah. is from Jack. 
Yeah, so we, we, that, is the, that is what we have partially done. Um, I didn't show these results, so yes, uh, we've done a virtual screening targeting this particular binding site by uh, using two different uh, docking software. Uh, and uh, we are basically, we have identified uh, small molecules. Uh, the, the trouble in testing these small molecules is basically that you need experimental settings that, um, that do contain basically the entire membrane in the full spike, as opposed to uh, easy inhibition assays that only contain the RBD part um, that, already, you know, that already exists. Uh, so this is now where we are uh, stuck. And uh, it would be very nice actually to have it, such experimental setups uh, with the entire spike and the memory where we can test our small molecules. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty much out of time today. So I'd just like to thank all of our brilliant speakers for coming along and giving such wonderful talks. Um, so just to round up with a few um, public service announcements for everyone here. Um, you can continue to um, follow the conversation online, follow at BiochemSoc and at PP Publishing on Twitter. If you would like to know more about this topic, we invite you to read some related content from a variety of issues and papers published by Portland Press, including a review paper written by one of our speakers, Robin Curie, who on the energetics of protein lipid interactions as viewed by molecular simulations. We welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focused webinar series. If you have an idea for a webinar, we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar. You can find more information about the webinars, propose your webinar and watch previous recordings on www.biochemistry.org slash webinars. Join us for the next webinar in the series and this is entitled COVID-Directed Evolution of Molecular Bioscience Teaching. And that will be on Thursday, the 13th of May at 2 o'clock BST. At this session, we'll hear from Dr. Joe Rushworth, recipient of the Biochemical Society's 2020 Teaching Excellence Award, who will share some of her remote teaching experiences around flipped remote learning, remote lab simulations, co-creation, inclusion and transitions, game-based learning, and lecturer as learner, as well as your, your chance to share your ideas and good practice. Um, so thank you very much. And finally, I want to highlight that in these new and challenging times, it's more important than ever to stay connected, engage with the biosciences community. Joining the Biochemistry Society's uh, biochemical societies, community of researchers and specialists is a great way to stay connected with your fellow molecular bioscientists and members can take advantage of a variety of benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals and more. Visit their website and find out more. So yeah, um, as I say, this has been an absolute pleasure to chair today's event. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you all have as well. And please do um, join us again soon for another one of these interesting webinars. Thanks to everybody and goodbye. Thanks. <laughs>